welcome everybody. Thanks very much for coming. Um, I'm excited to present my work to you tonight. And I'd like to start by giving thanks to the Muskegon Area District Library and the North Muskegon Branch for inviting me, and especially Holly Pelkey who invited me and then Michelle um, for her technical assistance tonight and Karen who you don't see, but she also helped with technical assistance here. I'm also grateful to many others who um, are supporting my work in different kinds of ways. Grand Valley State University, where I teach linguistics, as you heard in the English department, uh, my colleagues and students there, and the University of Wisconsin Press that published my book, Youper Talk, Dialect as Identity in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The many participants who've taken place, um, who've taken part, excuse me, in my study over the years, interviews with over 75 people, people I've met in town, um, talking on the street, all kinds of ways that people have helped me, librarians, archivists, and my friends and family. Of course, you. Um, I wouldn't be here tonight without you. Well, maybe I would, but I wouldn't have people to talk to. So I really appreciate you coming this evening. My presentation will focus on the social and linguistic histories of English in the Upper Peninsula, but especially the Northwestern part of the peninsula, and I'll talk about why that is. I look forward to your comments and questions and discussion after my presentation. I'm going to be kind of reading and talking at the same time and using two different devices, so it might get a little bit wonky, but hopefully that won't be the case. I do need to do one thing here, that way I won't see myself. All right, so um, my, as I mentioned, my focus my research on the Northwestern part of the Upper Peninsula from Marquette West through um, the Keweenaw Peninsula, which you see circled here on the map. I chose this area for two reasons. Not only because this is where the air, I have the most contacts. Um, I, my PhD is from Michigan Tech. I lived in Houghton, Hancock, and Calumet for five years. And because of that, I had um, local relationships, or I have local relationships, friendships with people. Um, and colleagues there who I could easily contact and they could put me into contact with everyone they knew and I used the snowball technique then to contact people to see if they would be part of my study. Mostly, like I said, through interviews, <clears throat> but some other ways as well. The other reason I've chosen this area is because this is where that ubiquitous stereotypical youper voice comes from. Now you might hear it in other parts of the UP like Ironwood or Crystal Falls or Escanaba, Munising, Sault Ste. Marie, but not as distinct as the Northwestern part of the Upper Peninsula. And that's partly because this area is so isolated from the other parts. The other reason is that more Finns settled here than any other place out, actually outside of Finland in the whole world, but in the UP. And I'll talk a little bit why that um, is significant in the dialect. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm particularly interested in how the idea, idea of the dialect has emerged over time through social and historical events such as immigration and language contact between English and languages that people speak and have spoken in the area, um, including the indigenous Ojibwe, economic factors like mining and agriculture, timber and tourism, and language attitudes that we have and that we reinforce through social media like memes and movies, TV shows, conversations and jokes with family and friends. This evening, I'll explain that the dialect, the sounds, the words, the grammatical structures are a result of social factors and historical events that continue to draw people to the region. And this is where I'm having some trouble turning my slide. Sorry. Oh, all right. Sorry about this. A little snafu. To understand what makes a dialect a dialect, it's really important to know its history. And the history of English in the Northwestern UP is relatively recent compared to other varieties of American English. It wasn't until the mid 19th century that English speakers regularly visited and then inhabited this area. The dialect's history combined with the area's isolation, the people who've immigrated to the area, where they've settled, who they mix and mingled with, the languages that they spoke, how those languages have come into contact with those other languages as well as English, 
are all factors that have helped maintain the dialect over time. There are five major factors that have helped the dialect develop into the variety that we recognize today. One is geography, and I had mentioned isolation. If you've ever been up to the Copper Harbor or any part of Keweenaw or even Marquette, it takes a, a good day's worth of driving to get there. Houghton is about 535 miles from uh, Grand Haven where I am, so it's a, it's a long trip. Historical events in the late 1800s and early 1900s, such as the French-Prussian War and World War I, pushed people out of Europe um, and toward other places like the UP. Language contact, like I mentioned, between speakers of English and other languages, including Italian, Polish, German, Canadian French, Finnish, Ojibwe, and Ojibwe is off, often also called Anishinaabemowin, many other languages, including Chinese. Economics, land, access to land, mining, agriculture, shipping, and tourism, and language attitudes, what we think of as good and bad English. So here's an important definition. I'm assuming that if you came to a talk on Youper Talk, you probably know what a Youper is. Maybe you are even one, um, but you might not know that it wasn't until 2014 that Youper appeared in a standard collegiate dictionary. And in fact, it's in Merriam-Webster's. Um, the, there's an interesting story behind how it got into the dictionary. It's a well-known word in Michigan, but if you go outside of Michigan, maybe Northern Wisconsin, Northern Minnesota, people have heard of Youpers, but if you go further south to Ohio, not very many people have known, known of Youpers or what that word is. So it wasn't surprising to me that when Steve Parks um, solicited Miss Miriam Webster to put Youper in the dictionary, they said no. This all started with a Scrabble game. In 2002, Parks was playing Scrabble with a friend and he wanted to use the word Youper and his friend said, no, it's not in any dictionary. You can't use that word, even though it is actually a word, right? Um, so he started, Parks started soliciting Miriam Webster and sending them evidence of Youper and that it is widely known. And over time, it took 12 years, they finally, um, conceded and put Youper in this variety or this version of their dictionary, the Merriam-Webster Collegiate Dictionary. And you can find it online even in, in this um, dictionary between your, Y-O-R-E, and Yuhu. It wasn't until the mid-1970s, however, that Youper was popularly used in print in the UP. And you can see this from the timeline. It's important to realize though that Youper dates in print from 1975. That's the first evidence we have from the newspaper, The Pick and Axe, which is from Bessemer, Michigan. It had to exist well before that in spoken language because everyday words we use like Youper or soap or shoe, they have to exist in everyday conversation before they're ever in print. Now it's different with technical terms. Technical terms might only exist in print. In these examples, you can see attitudes at work and their effects on what it means to be a youper. And some of these uh, examples link what it means to sound like a youper with the place as well as what it means to be a youper. And you can see 1975, um, the first evidence that I gave. 1979, it's also a contest in the Escanaba Daily Press and youper is the winner. 1982, sociologist uh, Michael Lukanen, who's a professor at Northern Michigan University and a filmmaker, he wanted to make a film called Youper, but um, a lot of people, especially older residents, were resistant to that title and felt that it can carry derogatory um, connotations, and it can. Youper isn't always used in a positive way, and so he changed the name of his film to Good Man in the Woods. In the 1980s, 83, 86, start seeing evidence of the dialect appear in public things like a bumper sticker, say ya to the UPA. And the band, the Youpers, changed their name to Da Youpers. And so something's happening in the 1980s where people start using the dialect to connect themselves with the place, but also with this identity of what it means to be a Youper. 
it's important to recognize that you doesn't always have positive connotations. And you can see that, for example, like I mentioned in um, the film example, but we call this contested meanings. For some people, um, the word is derogatory and for other people, it might be a point of pride and sometimes it might depend on the situation. What I have noticed in the past 30 years is is that the use of Uber has become more popular and more positive. You see it on more bumper stickers. I saw one at Meyer on the back of a car and it was the outline of the UP in pink and then it said Uber girl. Um, that's just one example. You can find hats and t-shirts and coffee mugs and all kinds of stuff. So this is evidence of the more um, popular as well as positive that the meaning ha um, has come over time. Let's step back in time a little bit here and talk about the history of the area so that we can understand the roots of the dialect. For at least 5,000 years, Ojibwe have lived in the UP seasonally, but it wasn't until the 1600s that French missionaries, French Canadian voyageurs and European explorers regularly visited the place. Over the next century, expeditions were made to investigate the rich iron and copper deposits that the Ojibwe had been mining for thousands of years. This led to a determined effort to mine the region. Discovery of the world's largest deposit of native copper in 1842 by the then um, state geologist Douglas Houghton drew thousands specifically to the Keweenaw Peninsula. And from 1840 through the early 1900s, it was a booming timber and copper mining region, boasting a population of 80,000 in 1900. We can contrast that population with today's population or the most recent census data. And for the Keweenaw, which is Barraga, Houghton, and Keweenaw counties, the population is about 46,000. So it was nearly double in the early 1900s. As the result of the copper boom, the Keweenaw became known as the copper country and most adults were in some way connected to the mines, mining industry or related industries like timber. The majority who came to work in the mines and related industries, not only, um, excuse me, let me back up a little bit. So timber was really important and it still is. And uh, logging especially at the time was to clear the land, but also it was uh, the timber was used in framing and you can see some of that in this photo, but not just framing underground, but framing for buildings, building houses, um, also for railroad tracks above and below ground. And for iron, um, wood was especially, and it still is important for firing um, the charcoal um, kilns that was were used to melt the iron ore. And in fact, charcoal is still an industry in the UP. You might have a bag of Kingsford charcoal in your garage or somewhere around, and that's from Kingsford, Michigan in the Upper Peninsula. So it wasn't just mining that drew people to the area. It was logging, agriculture, fishing, many other industries. Because these industries and the promise of prosperity, Marquette and the Copper Country drew people from far and wide. Finland, Sweden, Norway, Ireland, Cornwall, England, Italy, and in Italy, especially the Piedmont region, France, Germany, Canada, and the Austrian Empire, which um, today would consist of Croatia, Slovenia, and several other countries. In addition, people resettled from the Midwest and the East Coast, particularly Boston, and most of the people who settled from the Midwest and the East Coast didn't work underground, but worked above ground. Um, they were mining managers and officers. And in fact, you can see evidence of this in place names. Um, you see on this slide, the Quincy Mine. Quincy Mine is named after Quincy, Massachusetts, which is a city south of Boston. There's also a, a mining location and the locations are housing communities in the upper, um, in the Keweenaw that's called Boston location. So you can see evidence in place names if you look on a map or you know the area. In addition to being pulled to the region for economic reasons, historical events such as war and famine pushed people to the UP uh, from Scandinavia, Finland, Great Britain, Central and Eastern Europe and, and beyond. 
While some people settled in rural areas, others were attracted to larger towns like Marquette, Nottenoggin, Calumet, Houghton, Hancock, with the promise of prosperity and earned from businesses and shops, from mining, logging, and other industries. Collectively, these industries in agriculture, education, commerce were needed to sustain this burgeoning population. And the growing population and seemingly endless supply of copper and iron continued to draw laborers, merchants, artisans, teachers, others to the region through the early 1900s when production slowed and immigration restrictions curtailed or limited people of certain nationalities from entry to the US. For example, in 1924, there were immigration restrictions that limited um, the percentage or quotas of people that could come from Finland, Italy, and other places. This was also a result of changing changes in mining. It was a reduction in production. There wasn't as much copper and iron to mine, but also mining had become automated, so you didn't need as many laborers. So there was connection here between immigration restrictions and labor. With the new arrivals came many languages. For example, the group of Norwegians that you see in this photo and their cute little dog, um, they no doubt spoke Norwegian, but depending on where they were from in Norway, for example, if they were from the Northern part, they might've spoken Swedish. They also might've spoken Swedish or Finnish depending on what their backgrounds are. And I don't know anything about this group of people, but oftentimes agricultural workers um, migrated and from Finland, Sweden, and, and um, Norway back and forth. So people would have spoken those three languages or, or some of those languages. With these arrivals came many languages like Norwegian here. These heritage languages or heritage languages are languages that people speak in their home that aren't usually part of the wider community. These heritage languages and cultural practices were maintained through interaction at home, of course, in neighborhoods, rural communities where people might have um, lived near other people from their same ethnic or linguistic background, social organizations, and through church services. For example, in Calumet alone in the early 1900s, late 1800s as well, there were several language-based Catholic churches including St. Anthony's, which was a Polish speaking church, St. Joseph's, a German speaking church, St. Louis, a French speaking church, Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary was Italian, and John the ba St. John the Baptist was a Croatian church. So you can see how this multilingual community um, started, but also how it was maintained in ways. Calumet school records provide other evidence of this multilingual community. From 1908, their records show that there were students from over 40 different nationalities. So we can expect that they spoke probably at least half as many languages. Evidence of this multilingual community also includes Houghton Hancock newspapers that were printed in six different languages in the early 1900s. Because the majority of settlers didn't speak English as their first language, they typically learned an accented English from other non-native speakers. So most people learning English didn't learn it from an, an American English speaker, but from the neighbor, the German kid down the street or their older siblings in the house. As people mixed and mingled, their languages came into contact and in repeated contact with English and this new variety slowly took place, excuse me, took shape. And these languages affected the sounds, the words, the gramma grammar, grammatical structures that collectively form what we recognize today as UP English or UP talk. I had mentioned earlier that Finnish has had a lasting in impression and it's true out of all of the languages spoken in the area, Finnish has had a significant effect on English in the Northwestern part of the Upper Peninsula. And this influence on Finnish um, of Finnish on English is significant for several reasons that resulted in decades of contact between Finnish and English. Finnish were the largest group to immigrate and they were the last group to immigrate, one of the last groups. And so because they were a large group of people and they were one of the last groups, they've had a lasting impression. But more significantly is that Finnish isn't related to English. So it was more difficult for Finns to learn English 
unlike people who spoke German or Finnish, or excuse me, German or Italian or French, Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, all those languages are related to English. So it's easier for people to learn the English um, if they have similar grammatical structures, for example, or sim similar vocabulary, but Finnish has none of that. So it makes it more difficult. Another significant factor is that Finns tended to be literate where other immigrants, working class laborers were not literate typically, um, typically not even having very much schooling. And even Americans up through this time period didn't have a lot of schooling. My grandmother in fact graduated eighth grade and that was the end of her degree um, or her schooling. My grandfather had a fourth grade education. So you can see how um, education wasn't like what we think of it today and where people might have learned English, but Finns were literate and um, in Finnish and that helped maintain the language longer than it might be if people were not literate because people would read and they would write letters and they would send letters back and forth or um, have letters even in the community or across the UP with different people. So there were and newspapers of course too were another factor like I had mentioned. So literacy and English and Finnish not being related. But a third factor is that because of literacy, Finns tended to maintain their language in the home, the heritage language for four and five generations. And this is really rare. Even today, by the third generation, a heritage language is dead in a family, um, typically. The first generation, the people who immigrate might will definitely speak that heritage language and some English or maybe a lot of English depending on who they are and their experience. The second generation might be bilingual, but by the third generation that family is monolingual or those kids are monolingual English speakers. But because of literacy, Finns maintain their language four and five generations and because of that it had longer contact um, with English. Today there aren't very many if any native Finnish speakers in the UP. There are people who speak it as a second language. And in fact, Finlandia University teaches it as a foreign language, but it's not used regularly in the home like um, you might find in other places with, for example, Spanish that's used a lot in the US. So this long contact between Finnish and English really shaped the sounds, some of the vocabulary, and even some of the grammatical structures of English which today characterize what you might hear, see, or read with the dialect. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, we'll see how um, some of this contact with Finnish, but of other languages as well, has affected some of the sounds or phonology of the dialect. And when we talk about phonology, it's the sound system, how sounds work together. And we'll see how these sounds have changed um, over time in ways as well. So I'm trying to pull up my notes here. And these are just some phonological features. And I have pulled these out because I'm going to show you a very short 12 minute clip of two men speaking from Keweenaw County. They are in Kearsarge. Kearsarge is halfway, about halfway between Hancock and Calumet. No, it's not, it's, it's, sorry, it's about halfway between Calumet and Gopher Harbor, I'm sorry. And um, this was a clip from TV6 in December 13th. They're going to be talking about the snow and they're also, and they're also going to be using words that have some of these characteristic features. It's important to realize that not everybody uses these same sound features. Not everybody uses them all the time. And a lot of the use of them would probably depend on will depend, not just probably, on, on social class. It will depend on levels of education, which is often related to social class, occupation, um, people's backgrounds. So when you hear these, um, you'll hear dare for there, for example, and dis for this. You'll hear these stress to put and cuff. So he'll, you'll hear one man say yet, and winter, and last. So stressing those sounds. You'll also hear what we call a low and back, and that has to do with your tongue. Um, when the tongue goes low and back saying ah, for example, if I say that, and but you'll hear this, um, one of the men say that and last and laugh. And so the tongue is further lower, further back and lower than what I might say is that last and laugh. The tongue will raise in when you hear ow and I, so you'll hear him say down and highest where I would say down and highest. 
You'll also hear the first man start off by saying, um, the snow I like to play in and just pay attention to that. And then I'll come back to it in a little bit for something else. Um, I'll play this a couple times because it's really short and I will, hopefully you can hear it. The sound in the past hasn't been the greatest. Um, it, I keep changing my slide here by accident, but when I hit my mouse, so let me play this and you can listen for these features, these dialect features. The snow I like to play in and my toes are just broke down, so I got to fix that. Yeah, the hard part uh, is cleaning the roof off all the time, you know. Last year I fell off of it and, you know, with the snow there, it, it, it's a cushion, you know, and you fall in it and it buries you and, and you just lay there and laugh, you know. So far, this is not a normal winter. It, it's one of the highest snow levels I remember for this time of year, but it's going to be fabulous for the businesses that depend on the snow. So I'll come back to my slide here, and um, if I can do that, let's see. Oh, yep, sorry, oops. And sorry, I went through my slides again. And I'll just, so you can just pay attention a little bit more to the sound that you hear. So there and um, there and this, and then these stress sounds and the vowels. You'll hear some other sounds too, but I put some just a few on here just to, not overwhelmed, but I'm sure you recognize some others. I'll play it again since it was uh, pretty fast. The snow I like to play in, and my snow blower just broke down, so I got to fix that. Yeah, the hard part uh, is controlling the roof off all the time. You know, last year I fell off of it, and you know, with the snow there, it, it, it's a cushion, you know, and you fall in it, and it buries you, and, and you just lay there and laugh. You know, so far this is not a normal winter. It, it's one of the highest snow levels I remember for this time of year, but it's going to be fabulous for the businesses that depend on the snow. So I'll come back here to the slide. And <clears throat> Sorry, there we go. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so when you hear the two men here, you can hear the, some of these features and then the snow I like to play in, which I'll talk about. What's really interesting to me here is where these sounds have come from. And one example is with the dare dem dos for there and them those and dare and dis. English is one of the few languages that has TH sounds, the the, what we call the voiced, it's vibration in your throat when you say there and the th or the voiceless like in thigh. Um, and when speakers of other languages speak English, then they'll substitute a sound that's closest in the mouth and related to their language. So that's why we have dare dem dos or dare dis and uh, dare and dis here. This is really common dialect feature throughout the US. Uh, you probably have heard of de bears, right? In Chicago and dare dem does in Wisconsin, in Louisiana, dis and dat. Um, there's all kinds of uses of this and not just in the US, but other varieties of English spoken throughout the world. So this is a really good example of languages coming into contact and then those features staying over time. Now, of course, I mentioned not everybody says dare and dis in the UP, but many people do. And again, it's related to different social factors, also context, you know, who we're talking to and what we're talking about and where we are. Um, we will change the way we use language. In the next two slides, we'll see how the sound system or phonology is also a clue to the sociolinguistic past of the area and how these clues um, provide some evidence of language change as well. And now if my slide won't change it all. There we go. So in this slide, I recently attended a Zoom talk by the archivist at the Michigan um, Tech Archives. And she was talking about the labor strike of 1913. And that's what this image came, comes from. When she was giving her presentation, my eye got caught on this sign that you see up in the red box in the corner, Kivan al Rai. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's a really good example of a former pronunciation um, an older pronunciation of Kiwana that really reflects language contact. So many languages, um, especially German, Swedish, Norwegian, 
when there's a W, people will pronounce it as a V. And that's what you see here uh, with Kivanaugh instead of uh, Kiwanaugh, right? And it's also interesting to me is that it's spelled this way. And this is called an I dialect of what the spelling represents um, a pre pronunciation. It's also, like I said, evidence of language contact and language change because not very many people now will say Kivana. Uh, when I was collecting data in the early 2000s and in interviews, older people, uh, older speakers and participants did, but I haven't heard it very much like that anymore. Um, now, keep in mind, this is 1913, which is only 60 years after English speakers regularly settled, visited and then settled the area. So it's after six decades of intense language contact between um, English and many, many, many languages. Another example is Calcit Lats. And this is an example of language change. And also that when people um, start noticing language change, they often think a dialect is dying. And this sign is an example of English Finnish contact in, specifically. And it was made in, as a pun, and I'll talk about that. Um, so the two signs, the first, the one in the foreground here is a handmade sign by Wilbur Salmi, who lived down this road, Calcet Lax. And the, the sign in the background is obviously the official street name sign. It's on um, Quincy Hill. You can see the road here. This is US 41 going up from Hancock into toward Calumet. And in the background, you can see the mining um, scaffolding. And the mine, Quincy Mine, was in full operation from 1846 to 1945. And many of the miners and their families lived in mining um, company-owned housing, housing in these locations, like I mentioned, um, small communities around the mine. And many families had a cow. And in this community, um, there were cows and there was a communal pasture that was supplied by the mining company. And the, the pasture was called the flats. So flats is another name for pasture land. In the 1980s, Wilbur Salmi, who lived in this location, like I mentioned, down this road, in fact, he made this street sign and he made it as a joke. He placed the sign here at the intersection and he, the street wasn't officially named this. It wasn't named that until 2001. And he put his own street sign here and he approached the Quincy Township Board with the request that the road be officially named Calcet Lats. At the time, most rural roads didn't have names. Um, they were known by a geographical location or a family name or the, or the location name. And However, in 2001, so almost 20 years later, the emergency telephone number system 911 came into being and streets had to have names so that emergency vehicles could find the easily find the streets. And the township officially named the street Calcet Lats in 2001 and they placed this sign here. Now his sign is sadly no longer there. When I was, the last time I was up there two years ago, um, the rebar was still there, but his sign was gone. I took this photo in 2002. Now Salmi created this pun based on the history of the naming of the pasture, as well as his understanding, he's a Finnish, he was a Finnish heritage speaker, um, of the linguistic features that affect the dialect when people are the language, when people are speaking English as a second language. Now, this first word, calcit, is based on his understanding and knowledge that the Finnish alphabet doesn't have the letter C. It has a letter K instead, where we use a C and a K interchangeably depending on the, uh, the word. And he also was using an S here instead of an SH sound. Finnish doesn't have the SH sound like we have. And remember, cows visited this flats, right? These flats. So you can probably guess that cow sit here is cow shit if you were speaking American English or English. Now you're probably wondering about the flats part. Well, Finnish does, has a rule, a phonological rule, a sound rule that you cannot begin a word with um, two or more syllables. You can't have a, what we call a consonant, not syllable, sorry, consonants. You can't have what's called a consonant cluster. And so instead, when people speak English as a second language and their first language is Finnish, sometimes, not always, 
they will drop that first consonant. And that's what was happening here. People, instead of saying flats, would say flats. So they would say calcit lats or calcit flats. Now this joke is cute and it also so it was a really good example of understanding the linguistic history of the area, as well as the um, uh, anthropological history of the area, who lived in this area and that they had a cow field, right? Or a pasture land, a cow field. That sounds like you're raising cows there, but anyway. Um, but it's also a really good example of when people start hearing changes in the way people are speaking in an area, they'll think the dialect is dying. People will say, oh, the dialect's dying. People don't say, you know, calcid anymore. They'll say calcid instead. Well, it's not dying, it's changing. And here with this example is because people don't speak Finnish as a first language anymore. And people are speaking English as a first language and we do have the SH sound. So it's really important to remember that dialects just like language have to change as communities change, as society changes. And regional dialects, like local ways of speaking in the UP and up elsewhere, um, change and have to change um, as the population changes. So the dialect's not dying, it just changes over time. Another example of a local pronunciation is the word sauna, or the pronunciation sauna for sauna, S-A-U-N-A. And this is a really good example, again, of language contact between English and Finnish, no doubt other European languages where people would say sauna instead of um, sauna. The pronunciation is uh, signals local identity. And when there is a local pronunciation that's different from pronunciation of that same word from the outside, we should call this in linguistics a shibboleth. They're identity markers. They mark someone's identity as being local. And this linguistic identity here um, was on this set of billboards or this shibboleth in Ishpeming, and I took this in 2015. And we see the shibboleth sauna contrasted with the pronunciation sauna. And what's more interesting to me is how this insurance company really was smart in using the shibboleth to contrast these two pronunciations, but also to signal that they're local, that because they're local, you can trust them. They draw on a lot of positive meanings of what it means to be a youper with pronunciation here, but also about what it means to be local, trustworthy, honest, reliable, um, people who understand you and your insurance needs. Another example of a shibboleth is the pronunciation of pasty. And pasty here, this is a magnet, it's blown up obviously, um, that I bought at a tourist shop. And it's not pastry, it's not pasties, it's pasty, youper food of the gods. And this magnet emphasizes local ways of speaking as well as local ways of knowing, knowing how to pronounce pasty. And this magnet's presumably targeted toward outsiders on how to pronounce or really not, how not to pronounce um, these mispronunciations of pasty. And the reason why people will say pasties or pastry, it's a more common word for many people than pasty if they're not familiar with pasties. And today what we hear is local or sounding youper um, hasn't always been associated with the UP in different kinds of ways. And in fact, there's evidence that these different features like the for the we're more associated with being working class and an immigrant, but over time it's changed and these sounds have become localized. And I'm not, I won't get into that now, but if you have questions about it, I can, I, I can answer that later. What I would like to talk about is some of the vocabulary and the, or what in linguistics we call the lexicon and how everyday language use from place names to food items um, shows again the history of the area, the linguistic history and uh, the history of the people who've settled there. Now this list is just some words, um, some of the more common ones. And if you're familiar with Uper Talk um, or the UP, you probably can add to this list. And what you can see here are languages that have come into contact with English and have given us these words. Uh, we call them borrowing, borrowings in English or in linguistics, but we don't borrow them. We really just steal them. We never give them back. Um, for example, you can see Canadian French speakers gave us chook and Qatar and make wood. 
And Cornish English gave us bush and bloody and perhaps a, as in beautiful day, a, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Irish English gave us the plural use and uh, from Ojibwe, many place names and as well as direct translations of place names. For example, Laughing Wife Fish River is a direct translation from Ojibwe. Food names down in the bottom, you can see German, Finnish, Slovenian, Croatian. And you can see also other words as well. Food ways and place names are some of the most obvious ways that you can look at a language and look at what, what languages have come into contact um, and with English. And it pick up, take a map of Michigan and you can see evidence of French and German and um, even you know, indigenous Ojibwe and you can see um, Finnish, for example, in the UP, there's Toivola. There's lots of different examples of place names. There, pick any map um, of an English-speaking country like England, and you can see place names too, and how those reflect the history. Like I said, these are just a few examples, and you might even be able to add to the list. On this map, you see some other examples, and this comes from the cover of my book from the graphic designers at University of Wisconsin Press. And what's interesting to me when I look at this map and think about the vocabulary of what I know of the dialect is that some of these linguistic features are recognizable. You'll see them on magnets like pasty. You'll see youper, right? You'll see a, um, and in fact, when people ask me what I do or my research and I say, I study the UP, people will often say, you betcha. <laughs> so there are these that get really recognized, but some words don't get so recognized. So over in the Eastern part of the UP, you see bakery. And this is a sp specifically an interesting example to me um, because bakery is used. Here's an example from the Covington Music Festival. And it says all bakery fresh from Lowry's pasty shop and bakery here is the baked goods themselves. You see the use of bakery like this, meaning the baked goods themselves and other places where Germans settled. It's a direct translation from German. In Milwaukee, you can buy bakery in, in parts of Minnesota. Um, in Michigan, we tend not to use bakery like this that much, um, except in the UP um, and maybe some other places too, but especially in the UP. But again, it's really interesting to me how other dialect features get recognized and get put on hats and t-shirts and magnets and all kinds of stuff that you can buy. Yet bakery is one that flies under the linguistic radar, or recognition ra uh, radar. I've never seen a hat that says, give me some bakery or a t-shirt. And I think maybe that would be a good hat or um, t-shirt because I sure do like bakery. Another example of a word um, that I find interesting um, is that people think pank, um, many people think pank, who are familiar with this word in the UP, is only a UP word, but it's not. We have evidence from the Dictionary of American Regional English and the lexicographers or dictionary makers and researchers who put this together. That pank is in chiefly, chiefly found in Northern Michigan, um, and that's the UP, but also in Pennsylvania and upstate New York. What these three areas have in common is they are all mining areas, Scranton, Pennsylvania, um, and upstate New York. And I can't remember the town right now, sorry um, for that. But what you see here in the descriptions is pank means to pat down or make compact. Often people use it to talk about snow, but I've heard people talk about panking laundry in a basket to pat, pat it down, put more in there, or panking berries in a bucket when we're picking berries. And it, we're not quite sure where it comes from. That's why it says perhaps at the top. If you see a dictionary that says perhaps, it means that we're not quite sure where it comes from. It might be a blend of pack and spank, but Norwegians and Danes have the word banka and Swedish has banka as well. And all of these mean to knock, tap or beat very much like pank. And we know this word pank was used in the mines and we know that Norwegians, Danes and Swedes were miners. So we think the word came in with them. It's also, there's also evidence that it was used in the mines because people outside of mining towns in the UP typically don't know the word pank, but people in mining towns do. So interesting, a word like bakery flies under the radar, but pank, people take it as their own even though it's used in other places. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the grammatical structures and I'll just mention a few. And these first two examples are again, evidence of Finnish English contact. And the third example 
um, is an example um, of language contact from Cornish English and Anishinaabe or Ojibwe and Canadian English, or Canadian French, excuse me. I'll talk about this first, the illative phrase. Illative phrase is a phrase, a prepositional phrase that shows movement to or toward a place. So for example, let's go to the mall, or I went to the post office. In parts of the UP, you'll hear people say, let's go mall, or I went post office. And there is a general absence of prepositions that show movement to or toward a place like in or at or to, as well as articles a, an, and the. And this is a direct language transfer from Finnish. Finnish doesn't have prepositions. Instead, it uses postpositions or suffixes on the ends of nouns to do the same kind of grammatical information that prepositions show relationship and in, in, in that they show in English, so relationship, I went to the mall or let's go to the mall. Finnish doesn't have articles, a, an, and the. So over time, even though people aren't speaking Finnish anymore, this influence of Finnish has stayed where these features aren't always used. And um, you'll hear things, you, I had an email, someone sent me an email, I went casino last night and I hear I went post office or let's go mall. Um, but again, not everybody will use this and not everybody will use this feature all the time. And again, it depends on education, level of education and occupation and socioeconomic class. A lot of factors would affect um, when people would use this, um, the setting, who they're talking to. These tags, A and hey, that um, are a way of making connection with someone or sometimes asking for um, affirmation, have a nice day, A, or that's a pretty dress, hey. We think again, our transfer from Cornish English, um, Ojibwe and Canadian French, because all, all these three languages have a similar use of a similar sounding tag that would go on the end. And the Cornish English were some of the first English speakers who were minors who settled. They were often looked up to in the mines because they were English speakers, Canadian French speakers, and obviously Ojibwe were the original people and earliest settlers. So we're not quite sure where this came from because of the early contact with all of these. In the video clip I played, it started off and you heard the man saying, the snow I like to play in. What catches my ear about this is that English typically puts the snow in this sentence after the in, and in here he is putting what we would call the object of that preposition in at the front. English typically has the verb and then objects, and in this case he put it at the front. This could be a, um, a uh, over time an influence from German. I'm not sure where it has come from, um, but it caught my ear as something that was interesting and um, which signals a low way of speaking. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to finish here, and I'll I have I'll have some other things to wrap up. But talk about this fifth factor of affecting dialects. I've mentioned um, language contact, for example, and we saw historical events and um, people mixing and mingling, and their languages coming into contact. But our language attitudes also affect how a dialect gets used, who uses it, and it also um, can affect. Um, how long a dialect is spoken over time um, with um, shaming people into not using it. And I'll show you an example here. I'll read this and then talk about it. <clears throat> this is an example from um, an, it's an excerpt from a university student essay. And the essay demonstrates how language attitudes can and do have lasting effects on individuals and thereby the dialect itself. This student wrote, three summers ago while attending classes, I was sitting in class listening to the professor read over the syllabus. She veered from the syllabus when she began speaking about the upcoming oral presentations. At this point, she pulled the class to find out how many youpers were in attendance. I looked around and no one raised a hand, including myself. So you know there are other lo local students sitting in the class that she knows. I did this for three reasons. One, I was a freshman. Two, the class terrified me. And three, I was not going to be studied all term as if I were a dying species. She continued with a comment about youpers who attend the university by stating, when they're giving presentations, I always feel so sorry for them. The class chuckled, agreeing that youpers sound funny and showed sympathy. About 10 minutes later, I left the class and almost left the university. 
this is a really good example of linguistic prejudice and the related attitudes that um, do have real and lasting effects, especially for people who are labeled with speaking bad English or sounding funny, whether it's a social variety like African-American English or a regional variety like Uper talk. For this student, the effects were significant. Um, they dropped the class and they almost dropped out of school. Part of my interest in studying language variation and change is how we can change our attitudes about language and what we think of as good and bad English to foster social understanding, respect, and compassion by creating language awareness. The more we understand the history of the dialect, we can see that it's not bad English. We can understand where these grammatical features and sounds, um, pronunciations and vocabulary have come from. This understanding can lead us to know that dialects that are seen as bad English or improper are actually rule governed, resulting from language contact and language transfer, one rule for one, rules of one language to another, like you saw with the use of the prepositional phrases and um, to phrase, I went casino, for example. Unfor unfortunately, the prejudice that's often attached to dialects and accents isn't grounded in linguistic fact, but instead on prejudice um, or attitudes about the groups of people who speak those varieties. Linguistic prejudice is a mirror of social prejudice. Go anywhere in the world, and if you wanna find out what groups are stigmatized, find out what dialects or accents are stigmatized, and vice versa. If you wanna find out what people think sounds funny or is bad language in that area, ask them what groups or find out what groups are stigmatized. It goes hand in hand. They reinforce each other. So linguistic prejudice reinforces social prejudice in this way. And I think it's really important for us to know that all of us, you and me, our high school English teachers, we all have a dialect. Um, we have to, no one is dialect free. Um, it's our badge of identity in ways, our attitudes and values that we attach to ways of speaking and thereby to certain groups of speakers make us think that some of us are dialect free and others might speak with a quaint accent at least, and otherwise um, with bad English. All dialects, all varieties of English and the other languages are grammatical and rule governed. And that's why in linguistics we call that, we tend to call them varieties rather than dialects. And accents we use specifically when people are speaking English as a second language, the sounds that get transferred or the sounds of a dialect or the accent, just the sounds, not everything that makes up the dialect like the vocabulary and grammatical structures. As we've seen in the previous examples, history and interaction resulting in language, resulting from language contact are these key ingredients that have shaped the variety of American English that we recognize as Uper talk. And here in this example, we can see how attitudes toward dialects and perceptions about dialect speakers are also significant factors in shaping dialects and their use. While there are negative stereotypes associated with what it means to sound like a youper and what it means to be a youper, at the same time, there's great pride in being a youper and sounding like a youper. When I found out my husband's grandfather had been a lighthouse keeper in the UP, I loved my husband just a little bit more. <laughs> so there's some pride there and positive aspect of being a youper. In the UP, there comes a fierce pride of being local as well as a do it yourself, get by with what you have independence that's grounded in a history of hard labor, an isolated place that has a climate that can be really difficult to thrive in sometimes. This magnet you see here reflects the connotations between identity, place, and language with proud, tough, independent, and by mapping Uper right onto the UP. Reflected in the magnet is the most compelling reason for maintenance, maintaining dialect differences. Our identity, our language is one of the few and obvious ways that we mark who we are, where we're from, who our families are, where we've been, where we've grown up. And this not only includes our region, but our social class, our genders, ages, races, ethnicities, religious affiliations, all the different kinds of ways that we define and identify ourselves. And for this reason, our badge of identity, language is our badge of identity, dialects, including Uper talk are here to say. Now they'll change and we've seen evidence of that. 
but we don't know we don't know how they'll change. And in some um, places throughout the U.S., research has found that dialects get stronger. Not the whole dialect, but certain features. As people move in and they want to show their local, they'll pick up on specific features or certain features and start using them, and that will strengthen that feature over time. As a linguistic landscape shrinks through our online and geographic interconnectedness, local ways of speaking remain our badge of identity and thus dialects are here to stay. So to conclude, how do dialects like Yupertaki merge over time and through interaction through us as we shape history, as we share our attitudes about dialects and social media and conversations with friends and coworkers and family, as we interact with others and our dialects and languages come into contact. As with any dialect, the sounds and the words and the grammatical structures combine in unique ways to create UP English. By knowing the history of the variety, we come to understand how people, place, and language are tightly bound together. My hope is that by understanding the history of the Uper talk, you come to understand not only how and why the dialect has developed, but also that each of us have a role in affecting language change as well as affecting language attitudes and perceptions of people who speak differently than you do or I do. I also hope that this understanding leads you to an appreciation of the UP, if you don't already have one, of Upers and language variation and change in general. Thank you. I will um, stop sharing my screen now so I can see you and you can see each other. And if you have um, questions, I'd be really happy to take questions, or comments, or discussion. You can put them in the chat. Oh, there's some there. Um, oh, I'm sorry you were having he trouble hearing me. I didn't realize. I did see, I don't see the chat when I'm presenting. So I hope I got louder over time. No, I oh, think I heard that it fixed for us. So we were okay. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Yeah, this was fascinating to hear how some of these the dialect came along. My husband had a college roommate who would always say, the, the only way he said it was go bank. He didn't oh. use that for anything else. So we always thought that was really funny, but now I wonder if it's something his parents said. Yeah, where was he from? Do you know? Jackson, Michigan. Oh. But I don't know where his parents were from, you know, where they came from. So. Yeah, interesting that it was isolated to that one item. Yeah, we never heard him say it for anything else, just the go bank. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like anyone has any questions. There's no one typing anything in. I think you've answered everything we wanted to know, so you did a great <laughs> job. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate you yeah. being here. It was thank a pleasure. You. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for joining us tonight. We had a, this was very interesting. It was a good, Good discussion for us. Thank you. Thank you. And if you do have questions or comments, feel free to email me. You can go to Grand Valley's website and find my address there. I'm happy to email with you. Thanks very much for your kind comments too. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.